Welcome to Chatting the Pictures. My name is Kara Finnegan, and I'm a writer, teacher, and historian of photography. I'm Michael Shaw, a writer, psychologist, and publisher of Reading the Pictures. Michael, it's our great pleasure to have a guest joining our discussion today, Nina Berman. I'm a documentary photographer, author, filmmaker, and professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. This week, we are discussing photos from an article published at Reading the Pictures titled, Here are the photos of people suffering and dying of COVID. It was written in response to those who question whether these kinds of images exist or enough of them exist. For the broadcast, we have selected one photo each from three categories, photos of COVID patients and emergency medical technicians, images from hospital ICUs, and photographs of the handling and processing of bodies. Here's our first image. This photograph is by John Moore for Getty Images. It shows emergency medical technicians wearing personal protective equipment preparing to unload COVID-19 patients at the Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. The patients were arriving from another Montefiore hospital. The transfers were necessary to balance out the caseloads of hospitals in New York that were overwhelmed. This photo is so interesting to me because it's outdoors. We're not tending to see images of ill people in the outdoor setting. And so that's, I think, one of the first things that's really striking to me about this image, particularly that sunlight that's uh, coming in and that sun flare, I guess you could say, that you see in the top left of the photo. And then there's the quality of the light and the time of day that are really interesting. The photo is diurnal, but is it dawn? Is it dusk? Is it twilight? We see these trees. There's this evocation of nature. It's quite a contrast with emergency. And when you see all of those elements of nature, it really personalizes the photograph, makes it much more about life and death, about the experience of mortality. I was impressed at how John negotiated the element of privacy and still show the individual nature of each patient because we can't identify them, but we still feel connected to them because he's one, he's quite close to the woman in the foreground. And two, we notice little specifics, like we can see the woman in the foreground and she's got great hair, she's a bit older. So just as a photographer wanting to maybe protect the privacy of the patient, I think he did an amazing job of that. Also, how both patients are sort of looking towards the sun, as you mentioned, or looking in that direction, but also looking towards the healthcare workers who give a sense of tenderness and care. Like it doesn't feel like an emergency rush situation. It feels like a very careful process. That's different than some of the other pictures I think we've seen of, you know, overwhelmed healthcare professionals rushing to do things or to move one body from an ambulance to something else. And so there's a quiet and gentleness to it. As you said, it's a very intimate composition. And you have this kind of layering of the foreground into the background as we, along with that woman in the front, you know, look back toward the healthcare workers. And there's a textural element to that as well, so that you can see her gray hair, the tendons on her neck, you can see the snaps on her hospital gown and the hairnet, you see the texture of all of those things. In a context where the vast majority of us are in a position where we can't literally reach out and touch anybody, certainly not anybody who's ill, John Moore is putting us pretty close to that possibility and inviting us to put ourselves in, I think, that same kind of space, as you said, that the healthcare workers are in of care. Yeah, in fact, the photographer is exactly positioned where a healthcare person would be, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. And the way that their faces align also, as Nina was saying, is really powerful too, where it is in line with the sun and it really has that quality also of two people awaiting their fate or meeting your maker, if you will, if you're more religious. I think it's important also to think about race in the context of this photograph. The woman in the front appears to be African-American and in a context of this pandemic, which has disproportionately brought more severe illness and death to African-Americans in this country. I think that's important to notice as well. And so to have her front and center seems to be an important thing to notice also. 
And he also does that through his choice of aperture. If you look carefully, you can see all the details in her, in her face, in the gurney. But as the picture goes towards the background, you can see that it was shot at on a medium aperture, maybe like a 5.6, but not at f16 because the trees are not sharp. The healthcare workers are not sharp. And so his choice of aperture also makes you focus more on her. Here is our next image. This photograph was taken by Danny Kim for Time. Kim is a photographer who spent 13 years as an EMT before becoming a paramedic in 2016. It shows a coronavirus patient being prepared to be intubated by an anesthesiologist. The plastic tent is being used to prevent the spread of the virus. Kim is putting us kind of at the bottom of this triangle, if you will, in a position of witnessing, in a position of a kind of surrogate healthcare worker, perhaps. As with the last photo, we're brought in not only into the hospital room, but we're really implicated in what it is that is about to happen and is happening to the patient. Science is something that seems to be missing in a lot of the way that the government's handling the crisis. This is so full of science and medicine and technology from the cables and the wires and the tubes to the intubation tent. There's what's called intubation boxes. And this seems to be like a hybrid between a box and a tent. The doctor or nurse can put their hands through those two little holes and administer treatment without any exposure at all. And then you also see the ducting in the background. So many of the patients who have been in ICUs have required these negative pressure rooms, which lower the air pressure in the room to allow outside air in and prevent harmful particles from getting out. I was really struck by so many of Danny Kim's pictures. I thought it was a super series that Time was able to publish. I believe these pictures were taken the earlier days before hospitals started to open up so much to the press course. This particular picture for me struck me, I think, because we know that only 20% of people intubated actually survive. The lifelessness of the person, the likelihood, in fact, that this person would not make it, it almost seemed like this quiet ritual they were going through. I don't know. I found it very sad, almost painstaking. Yeah, that they almost know something already that we don't know. I think that's really telling. There's something kind of witnessing or there's like a sanctity to that body language. There's been photographs of priests and rabbis, but it really feels like that person on the left could be a member of the clergy instead of a medical professional. One of the things that's so difficult about this pandemic is the extent to which people who are very ill are deemed to be alone or dying without family and friends. This photograph, I think, highlights the extent to which that's both true and also not true. And healthcare workers who are in these contexts have said, you know, they're not alone, we're with them. The other thing I would say is that the photograph, I think because of that head-on composition, shows us what tight spaces that people are being treated in and working in. You really get the sense that people are moving and working in very constrained spaces where they can't be distanced from one another. That element of claustrophobia really stands out for me in this image. Here is our next image. This photograph was taken by Philip Montgomery for the New York Times. Here we see Nick Faranga, a funeral director in New York, retrieving a body inside a refrigerated 18-wheel trailer that is currently loaded with 40 bodies. There's a small area on one body bag that was altered in the photograph to obscure the identity of one of the deceased. Just as we saw with the two images we discussed previously, photographers have to think about that, don't they, Nina? Yeah, of course, because... You don't want to have a picture published of somebody whose family doesn't fully know what's happened yet or is not okay with you taking that picture. But yeah, I think that there's a whole set of negotiations that would happen to get access into a room like this and certain ground rules that are discussed. And the photographer needs to make sure that they're living up to that agreement. This was a story that showed a unique degree of sensitivity and wasn't just a shot of 40 corpses. Because that became a theme in the photography. would find a funeral director that was overwhelmed, find a picture of a tremendous number of caskets. But this particular image, you get the feeling that he's cradling someone he knew or someone he loved or someone he talked to or someone he wished he could talk to. And I just found this picture so beautiful. I wonder to what extent 
the choice to reproduce this image as black and white plays into that. I think just the contrast between light and shadow here is almost ethereal, and I think it speaks to that point directly. Yeah, I mean, all of his work for the Times and much of the work he does is black and white. I think that it's been a challenge for people photographing in color to communicate similar kinds of feelings because we see such repetition of colors that don't necessarily come together in a way that can be harmonic. So you've got either the blue scrubs or the green scrubs that are everywhere in a hospital. And then you may have greenish light or linoleum floors. And it's very hard to make a gorgeous set of colors within that frame or colors that speak to something beyond this is the color this room is. What's really stunning about this photograph is how incredibly nurturant and maternal the treatment of the body is by the funeral director. The grip on the fabric captures a kind of tension palpable with this crisis. And then the gaze and the other arm and the way the body is carried, there's almost like a pieta aspect to this, is really loving. And an image like this would typically elicit a morbid reaction or some kind of denial. People would not want to see it. But this really personifies the reality of death and loss. And effectively, the photograph embraces death as a cultural imperative. And I think that is extraordinarily important. I note for the record that this is a fifth generation funeral home family. And I think that matters too, that there is not only a caring, respectful person here handling the body of the person who's died, but also a professional. If you look through that transparent gown, it looks to me like what you're seeing is a white shirt and a tie, which is what a funeral director wears. A transparent gown is really something. It's a beautiful textural element also in a weird way kind of connects the man with the body in terms of the bag. I see this picture as a response to the Hearts Island drone pictures. They're kind of two ends of the spectrum. And those Hearts Island pictures I thought were super important. Deep respect to the photographers who went out there to do it. But it's two very different polar opposites in terms of how death is handled. One is the state burying as many bodies as possible in a short period of time. John Doe's. And then something like this, where the director has a name and he knows who he's burying or he knows the name and he's contacted the families. And so different ways that how we see death experienced. And I think that's a really important point because the more you start to see similar imagery, the quicker people become inured to the meaning and impact of that imagery. There was a lot of photographs in New York where you saw bodies on gurneys that looked like they were almost abandoned in hospital loading docks. Then you saw photographs where there was more of a production line kind of system for processing them. And you can get desensitized very quickly. So that's why a photograph like this is even more important. Yeah, I agree. I found some of the other funeral home pictures not as empathetic. And I think that the one thing that this pandemic requires is a sense of collective empathy because it's a pandemic experience so differently depending upon who you are, where you are, where you live. If there's going to be any kind of collective approach to helping people out, there has to be a sense of identification and photographs do that or can do that when they're done well. Thank you for joining us. We encourage all of you to read our post this week. We also encourage you to check out our site on Instagram, Reading the Pictures, and at Reading the Pics on Twitter. Thank you so much to Nina Berman for joining us and discussing this really powerful and important and difficult material.